体何が見えるってんだよ World War I, like many wars, saw an accelerated speed in the development of technology out of an accelerated innovation spurned by the conflict. And one of the most influential of these was the tank. First debuting in 1915, tank models such as the Whippet, FT, and all sorts of versions of the British rhombus tanks, among others, were found all over the Western Front by war's end. Now, although designs varied, there were some universal principles that each vehicle tried to adhere to, such as caterpillar tracks, because when the ground looks like this, you really don't have any business driving a wheeled vehicle through the battlefield, as well as good weight distribution on those tracks, because soft ground can be a worse enemy than the enemy if you don't have good points of contact to keep moving forward. And, at least for the most part, keeping the designs fairly simple to where all the parts can be universally manufactured cheaply and easily to where you can create these vehicles in large enough quantities for them to make an impact. But before any of these principles began being adhered to, the Russians created this. This is the Tsar tank, the brainchild of engineer and award-winning IRL shitposter Nikolai Lebedenko. Nikolai Lebedenko. Who took influence from Central Asian handcarts with large wheels that were able to relatively easily traverse potholes and roads to create a war vehicle that could smash through the German lines and win the war for the Russian Empire. After coming up with his concept for the deadly wheelchair in 1914, Lebedenko made a scale model of his creation powered by a small spring motor, similar to a music box, that he presented to the Tsar who was very impressed with the design and the model's ability to climb obstacles in the form of some books on the ground. Immediately ordering a prototype of the extreme Ferris wheel, putting a lot of resources behind its production that would add up to about a quarter of a million rubles, equaling what would be tens of millions of dollars today. The Tsar Dank's design consisted of two large front wheels, 27 feet tall, each powered by their own 250 horsepower Maybach engine recovered from a German Zeppelin, balanced by a very heavy 5 foot tall rear wheel, all connected by an axle and a rear leg that supported 10 to 12 guns, 6 to 8 of which would be in top and bottom turrets across the axle, with additional guns and two sponsons outside of the front wheels, screwed by between 10 and 18 men all at a weight of just around 60 tons. For all this though, the steampunk murder wagon was in theory going to be able to move at a top speed of around 17 kilometers an hour, that although pretty slow, would be faster than any other tank that would eventually see combat in World War I, and actually had a pretty good power to weight ratio compared to them, even though it is mostly remembered rather falsely nowadays as being underpowered. Construction took place at multiple factories, with the parts planned to be transported individually to the front, where they would then be assembled before the tank was taken into action. Once the prototype was completed, a field test took place in August of 1915, where the capability of the vehicle would finally be put to the test. The test began well, with the tank easily killing a tree and moving forward on a small road made of tree trunks. Problems began, though, when it continued on into some softer marshy terrain, and its rear wheel began sinking into the ground, followed quickly by the forward two due to all 60 tons of the thing being distributed amongst three very narrow pressure points on the ground. Due to its weight, the Tsar cycle was unable to drive itself out of its predicament, and no other vehicles around were able to pull it out of the mud, beginning its reputation as a very underpowered vehicle even though to this day, most vehicles need assistance when stuck in the mud to get moving again. And from everything that I could find, it stayed there till about 1923 when it was eventually scrapped. So there's not an example of this thing left today. Slow down there, dumbass. There is apparently a full-size replica at the T-34 Tank History Museum in Russia. Although I could barely find any information on it and this is the only video that is online, I think. Now this tank has gone down in history as largely a mistake, although an ambitious one. And given the complete opposite direction that tank design went after its short life and poor performance, it's not really hard to see why. But, even though it wasn't really a good idea, I don't think it's quite as dumb as people make it out to be. When most people think of World War I, they think of exclusively the Western Front, which this thing obviously would not have done well in, and would have easily rivaled the Titanic time and time again for a dramatic sinking in the soft lunar landscape that was trench warfare. But this is not really the case of a lot of the fighting in the East. On the Eastern Front in World War I, there were trenches and front lines and all of that, just like in the West, but it was much more a war of movement. 
often seeing fighting over large grassy plains, where in that situation, the Roly Russian, if deployed correctly, could have potentially had an impact similar to the first British tanks in 1915. Seeing five of these monsters running towards you, machine gun bullets raining down from above, could very quickly ruin your day. And although the Germans would surely adapt fairly quickly and figure out ways of killing the large target, as they did with the British tanks on the Western Front, the impact could still be there. And if the designers had the vast flat plains in Russia in mind, as I'm sure they did when working on the vehicle, it suddenly becomes a lot less stupid as long as the ground is firm enough to support it and becomes the first in a long line of tank designs by the Russians and later the Soviets, and, and then the Russians again, I guess, that is misunderstood by the West due to not taking into account the terrain that their vehicles were designed to fight on, the implementation of them on it, and how that is obviously going to impact design. They don't need that much gun depression if you're planning on fighting them in flat terrain on the offensive. I do think it would be pretty interesting if the Tsar tank was more successful to see what would happen in the aftermath. It'd probably only be for a brief period, but for a while, you might see two competing ideologies for tank design. One with caterpillar tracks and one with big ass wheels. Like, what would the next step in the evolution of this be? Hoi 4 gave us the big bob. What would the big czar be? Eh, it'd probably be bad. I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon who, through their generosity, make all these videos possible, some of which you'll see here on the screen. A few of the nicknames for the tank were their contributions, and thank you guys who submitted those. I hope to be doing a few more shorter videos in between the longer ones like this in the future, so let me know how you like this one. As always, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you next week for another one.